Are you an animal lover at heart? Do you like collecting pets in your D&D campaigns? Well, have I got the druid subclass for you. Circle the Shepherd revolves around all things animals. You are their protector and summoner. So without further ado, let's get into why you should play Circle the Shepherd Druid. This guide is based on my personal experiences. I will not be going over basic subclass information y'all can probably read. I've played or DM'd for all the druid subclasses. My opinions probably do not align with the D&D community at large. I'm going to be giving rankings for subclasses based on five criteria. Roleplaying potential, spell casting, wild shaping, utility, and the X factor, or something different that the subclass brings to the table that is unique from all the other subclasses. Each druid subclass feature can gain 5 points in each category. However, the later in level a class feature is gotten, the more heavily it will be scrutinized. Since most parties never reach 10th level, abilities that come after 10th level won't be given as much weight. Alright, with that out of the way, let's begin. There's a lot to love about this subclass. Firstly, you're an animal lover. This is built into the very core of this subclass. Speech of the Woods lets you talk to animals, and who doesn't want to just talk to their pet? whenever they want and understand them. And of course, with all the summoning options you get, that leads to lots and lots of pets. And let's talk about summoning because that is the core idea behind Circle the Shepherd Druid. You're going to be summoning lots of animals and creatures to come help you in combat. Literally, four out of the five of this subclass's features revolve around summoning something. So, if you want to bring more entities into the battlefield, you go with Circle the Shepherd Druid. Additionally, it is a prolific healer when it wants to be. At second level, you get your Spirit Totem, which is essentially the core subclass feature that you're going to be able to use no matter what. You have three different spirit auras that you can summon, the bear spirit, the hawk spirit, or the unicorn spirit, and where the healing comes into play is with the unicorn spirit. Here it is if you want to read over what the unicorn spirit does, but essentially restoring hit points to each creature of your choice within your aura, and this aura is incredibly large. A 30-foot radius around a totem can essentially cover most of a battlefield depending on your totem placement and how your party spreads out. Therefore, one cast of a healing spell heals everyone else inside basically your totem aura. And this really helps with the action economy because you're not just healing one creature, you're healing everyone who needs to be healed. You can pick up multiple party members with just one healing spell, which is incredibly powerful. And of course, because you have summoned creatures to help you deal damage in combat, you taking the time to heal isn't going to prevent you from dealing damage and taking down enemies on the battlefield. The subclass has a core feature and everything that it does plays around that feature. In this way, Circle of the Shepherd has a very unified design. If you have that very specific summoner archetype that you know you're going to want to play at pretty much all levels, you're going to just go and take Circle of the Shepherd because it's going to allow you to do that. So let's talk about concepts now. What is the overarching concept behind Circle of the Shepherd? Well, obviously, shepherds tending to animals, keeping safe those creatures that cannot defend themselves, are all built into this archetype. You're a tender and lover of animals, so there are a lot of different roles that could fit into that. One of the obvious ones is you are literally just a shepherd wandering around the wilds of Faerun or Greyhawk Dark Sun, wherever your campaign is taking place in. Now, shepherds are usually nomadic. They, of course, take care of groups and flocks of animals, usually all of one type of animal, but maybe your shepherd is a little bit different. And shepherds historically usually work together in groups looking after their own herds or flocks and bringing them together at times merging their responsibilities. Basically, being a shepherd is usually a collaborative effort. Most shepherds would live in small cabins, often shared with the animals that they herd and shepherd, and would buy food from the local communities, occasionally stopping in to whatever town they were passing by from. Sometimes they would be completely nomadic and on the move all the time, living in covered wagons and tents and traveling with their flocks to find new feeding grounds. And just that concept alone gives you a lot of room to work within a backstory. Who are the other shepherds? Were they actual druids like you? Were they clerics of nature? Who were they? What did you shepherd? Did you shepherd the normal sheep? 
Or maybe did you shepherd something interesting? Like, I don't know, a griffin or boulettes? How'd you shepherd a boulette? I don't know. Why do you love animals so much? Why did you choose to become a specifically a circle of the shepherd druid? Was the person who trained you with all the other shepherds, or did you go off and get some special training? Who did you meet along the way in your travels? Did you experience any interesting or plot-worthy events? Basically, you have a lot of room to operate here when you are making your backstory. Another fascinating part about playing a Circle of the Shepherd Druid is learning and creating the animals that you're going to summon or that you know well. You're not just summoning a direwolf, you're summoning Kenny the direwolf. You're not just summoning a shark, you're summoning Phyllis the shark. Whatever you want to do, you can make these certain animals that you are summoning, at least their spirits of, every single time, like a familiar. Or they can just be generic animals, but I know that a lot of Circle of the Shepherds begin to latch on to specific specific animals that they summon. So maybe if you're starting out and you are above level three, consider having a little backlog of animal spirits that you will readily summon. Maybe that unicorn spirit is named and has a personality. Or of course, you can let that pop up naturally during role-playing, but make sure to key your DM into this so that they can help you along during that journey and process. I'm not going to talk a lot about multiclassing. Actually, I'm not really going to talk about it at all because I think it's pretty bog standard druid multiclassing rules. You got barbarian, you got monk, you can go cleric if you want for a little bit of a healing boost because that unicorn totem is so powerful. Uh, maybe sorcerer, maybe fighter. You, it's completely wide open to you how you want to multiclass. Really, I don't think that Circle of the Shepherd benefits a ton from the higher level druid class features, so multi-classing is something I'd recommend if you're playing a Circle of the Shepherd druid. At least once you get past 14th level and you get all your abilities, just consider branching out if you're looking for something with a little bit more mechanical power. But obviously, taking a druid to 20th level is never a bad option. Now let's get into the flaws of this subclass, and I'll be frank, I, I have many, many gripes with Circle of the Shepherd. I am just not a big fan of this subclass at all, and I'll try to go into as much detail as I can while not being boring and trying to repeat myself. But firstly, I just don't like the core concept of summoning, and this and I don't like it specifically in 5th edition D&D because I don't think it's implemented well. Summoning more creatures slows down combat, it crowds the action economy, and it forces more time between turns, between player turns. As a DM, you can wait forever for your monsters to have turns. You can wait, you know, 30, 40 minutes because you constantly are having to do things, tell players whether they hit or miss. You don't want players sitting around for 30 to 40 minutes waiting for their turn because you have this summoner subclass over here that is filling up the action economy. And sure, maybe all of their creatures are acting on the same turn, but if you have summoned, I don't know, eight dire wolves or a few brown bears with multiple attacks each, it's still going to take a while. Especially if you have a player who's not on their game and does take a while to go through a turn in combat, that combat time, at least from round to round, that might have been 20 to 30 minutes, now becomes bloated to 45 minutes to an hour just because you have this summoner. And I wish I was exaggerating, but I've seen it time and time again. And yes, there are ways and methods that you can implement as a DM to have players speed up their turns in combat, but that still hasn't helped, at least from the games I've seen. Because even if you cut combat time in total by 20 or 30%, you're still not cutting down the summoner's time. You also have a player that now has to keep track of many, many stat blocks and abilities, which can be super overwhelming. And just managing all the summons is really hard for some players. Keeping track of six different health pools is no easy thing, especially when those six summons that you have all look the same. So as a player for both the summoner and the other players around the table, I think that it degrades the quality of the game and I think it degrades the fun of a dungeon master as well because summoning breaks design a little bit. And let me explain why. If I calculate for you summoning your creatures as you usually do as a Circle the Shepherd Druid and it doesn't happen, 
the party is screwed because now the action economy is super unbalanced. And if I don't balance an encounter for summoning, then my encounter is screwed because I am not anticipating then who knows how many other strong creatures leaping into the battlefield. And obviously, you don't just want to drop a bunch of AoE attacks to destroy all the summons because that defeats the fun of being a summoner shepherd. There are obvious ways around this problem, but it's just a headache for me as a DM, and I just do not like it. Moving on to the actual subclass, you don't get summoning until about level 5, which is really late. Because summoning for a druid is mostly focused around one spell, Conjure Animals, that you get at 5th level because it's a 3rd level spell. And you know what? That's pretty late, and on average most D&D parties won't get far beyond level 6, at least statistically. Of course, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything worked to help fix this a little bit, introducing the spell Summon Beast, which you get at 3rd level because it's a 2nd level spell, but I almost consider that uh, a different class of summoning. You don't really get to decide what exact creature you're summoning, as it's more of this spirit. It requires a 200 gold component, which is a big hurdle for some players to get. And in most written adventures, getting 200 gold by third level, and then finding someone who can craft the material component, a gilded acorn, can be tough. And those adventures, I'm looking at you, Lost Mine and Fandelver, really don't have a great workaround for this. You're going to have to find a DM who is going to help you get the Gilded Acorn, which is possible, but again, it's just another hurdle to try and overcome. So while you can summon at third level, you can summon one spiritual thing of either air, land, or water, it's not that true summoning feeling of being able to summon any beast under CR2 and multiple numbers of them for really whatever you want or need. Additionally, I think that some of the summoning features just don't hold up. The 6th level Mighty Summoner only makes summoning viable and it doesn't necessarily make it great because the extra health for a summons won't do much on average because the hit die amounts are only going to give it maybe a 20% boost and for most enemies, they're just going to eat through that. Maybe they survive an additional hit, but they're not mighty. They're not now these tanky things that are going to be around forever, especially as the higher levels you go. Uh, yeah, those summons just aren't going to keep up. I will say though, the magical attacks are very nice and they do help your summons out a lot to keep up at least damage wise later on in adventures. However, there's a problem and that's that uh, Mighty Summoner's health gain doesn't affect the creatures that you get from, or the creature you get, from Summon Beast. And this is because the Beast Spirit doesn't have hit die. So the HP is based off of the spell level, and your Mighty Summoner is just not going to affect that. Which is super disappointing. And this gripe also applies to Summon Fey. I forgot it when I was writing this episode, but just popped back into my head. Actually, it applies to, I think, every one of the Tasha's spells that aid with summoning, which is really rough because the Summoner Druid only has access to nine summoning spells in total that cover pretty much three classes of creatures, the Beasts, the Fae, and the Elementals. But out of those nine spells, you're going to get four of them where your Mighty Summoning future is nerfed. And I'd also say that while the health gain across the class is good, I don't think it stands up at higher levels or even mid-game, say 9th or 10th level. It just starts to fall behind. Now, it gets really good if you're populating the battlefield with lots and lots of smaller creatures, but then we run into the summoning issue that we previously discussed, which is the game and the combat just grinds to an absolute halt, which I personally do not like as a DM, and I know a lot of players who hate it as well. And I think my final flaw that I have with this subclass is that you get faithful summons so late. Now, it's a really cool, really powerful ability but you almost never use it because it's at 14th level. And by 14th level, as a druid, how often are you going to be going unconscious in combat? And also, four level two beasts, which is your maximum, aren't actually going to help you that much. 
because when you're reaching those higher levels, those creatures are at a high enough CR where your summons just aren't going to be doing very much because beasts are probably the least powerful class of creature there is in 5th edition. Really, I look at faithful summons as this. These creatures that you're summoning are just bags of hit points a DM can attack to prevent a TPK or protect other people around. And that's nice, but again, an AoE just destroys those creatures. Even with your additional health that you're providing, they're just gone. Like that. Again, yes, I know that Faithful Summons is really good. I'm just pointing out a few things that make it not as great as you would imagine. And getting it at 14th level means the majority of Circle of Shepherd players who are really wanting to use that cool ability just aren't going to get it. Now, if you got a version of Faithful Summons at 10th or maybe even 6th level, you'd have to nerf it tremendously or maybe scale it off a proficiency bonus. I don't know. But then I think it would really help out this subclass a lot. And another thing to consider, and this is kind of a fix for summoning, if you will, don't summon more than one or two creatures. And if you really want that horde and to have all those extra attacks and really help balance out the action economy, I don't know, talk to your DM and see if you can just combine technically all of the creatures in a group into just one stat block. Like you have the stat block for the wolf group. You make one attack roll, and if you hit, you deal this much damage. If you miss, you'll still do half damage. It's going to make things go a lot quicker. And if that doesn't jive with you, I would also just say use average damage. Because honestly, the rolling probably takes up 50% of the time when you're going through all of these large groups of creatures. Now the other 50% is the player actually determining what they want this horde of wolves or badgers or whatnot to actually do, but that's just a problem that you're not going to really be able to solve. Or you can, but again, it's just more and more hassle. So let's get to the ratings. We'll start with role-playing, and that's an 11 out of 20. I think it's solid, but Really, the role-playing aspect comes solely from the summoning of animals. That's what a lot of the class features are for. And I wish that they gave a little bit more of a foundation for what the Shepherd Druid is. Speech of the Woods does a really great job infusing the subclass with that role-playing favor. And I wish other features infused the subclass with that same role-playing energy as Speech of the Woods and Faithful Summons do. Spellcasting is a 15 out of 20, and if it helped other types of spellcasting other than summoning, it would have been a 20 out of 20. But since it only really helps that summoning, the most I'm going to give it is a 15 out of 20 in that regard. But hey, if we're just talking about summoning spells, it's 20 out of 20. Wild Shaping is 1 out of 20. I give it that one point because Speech of the Woods can help you while you're wild shaped, like if you're going around as, I don't know, a squirrel and you want to talk to a cow or a horse or something, you technically can. So there is that niche use there, but uh, there's, there's basically just not a lot here for your wild shape. Utility. This is a 9 out of 20. It's average. You get an average amount of utility. I think Speech of the Woods is super, super useful and that makes such an impact on the game as well as uh, Spirit Totem and the ability to use all your other totems is, again, useful. But all these other class features just don't provide a ton of utility. And finally, the X Factor. How unique are you and how good are your unique features? I give it a 17 out of 20 because Circle of the Shepherd is extremely unique. While some of its things I do have gripes with, I still believe that if they if you're just wanting to be a pure summoner and you're looking at it in a vacuum, in a void, it's very unique and the features are overall pretty good. And so then we come to the overall, and the overall for Circle of the Shepherd is of course a 53. That doesn't make it a bad subclass, it makes it average. It's an average subclass. It has, you know, good spots, it has bad spots, but it's not this world beater subclass. I don't think it should be spoken about in, I guess, the same breath as some of the other more powerful subclasses. And I also want players to know what they're getting into because 
You're pretty much not going to be using those later level abilities. If you're wanting to be summoning all the time, that's not going to happen either because you have a limited amount of summons. Basically, use this video as a word of warning because yes, Circle of the Shepherd can be extremely fun to play, but you also need to know some of the drawbacks of playing. If you're starting at third level or you know the campaign is going to be going on for a lot of levels and you and your DM can come together and really solve what I think is just the summoning problem, that umbrella area within 5th edition D&D, and really talk through how you're going to be implementing the mechanics and making sure that not only are you having fun, but all the other players in the DM are having fun, then yeah, I think that this is a super solid subclass. But I'm going off averages here, and I think based on the averages, it's just an average subclass. Not good, not bad, just average. And that's my opinion. But that opinion also comes with an inherent bias against summoning in 5th edition in general that I do recognize, and I think you should recognize, when you're looking over this video in its totality. But if you're looking for more Druid subclass videos, I suggest this video right here. And thank you for entering the dungeon.